And now, we would like to introduce our wonderful breakfast speaker, Professor Rory Little, who we are very honored to have with us here today. Since 1994, Professor Little has served as a professor at Hastings, where he teaches courses in crime law, criminal law and procedure, professional responsibility, and has been awarded the best professor three times over by his third year class. He's an active member of the ABA, having served on very many committees and task force, and he's also a nationally recognized authority on criminal litigation ethics, federal criminal law, appellate litigation, and constitutional issues. He was recently recognized in the 2010 National Law Journal's Appellate Hot List and the Legal 500 of the United States for 2010 and 2011 recognized Professor Little as one of the leading appellate lawyers in the United States. Professor Little practiced law for 12 years before entering academia. In addition to three years of private practice, Professor Little served as a federal prosecutor for the Organized Crime and Racketeering Strike Force, prosecuting cases of labor racketeering, money laundering, narcotics, and other organized criminal activity. He also serves as the chief of the appellate section for the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of California and has argued over 50 cases in the federal courts of appeal. More recently, Professor Little's governmental service includes a term as an associate deputy to Attorney General Janet Reno in the United States Department of Justice, where he managed complex civil, criminal, and ethics issues. After graduating from Yale Law School, Professor Little served as a law clerk to the U.S. District Judge Louis B. Oberdorfer in Washington, D.C., Justice Potter Stewart, working on matters before the first, third, and sixth circuit courts of appeal, and Justice William Brennan, Jr., Professor, uh, and, and Justice William J. Brennan, Jr., Professor Little also took part-time for Justices Powell, Stevens, and Chief Justice Berger, which was really a unique one-year experience. Professor Little was born and raised in New Jersey, which he says probably explains a lot of things. <laughs> and he also has three children and is a marathoner. Professor Little, thank you. I had no idea she was going to read that whole thing. I apologize. Uh, let see if I can make some amends. Um, so I want to thank um, Judge Becton and President Gee and Teresa Hurley for inviting me out to the foreign territory of uh, Contra Costa County. Uh, I drove here from Marin County this morning, it took me about an hour. Uh, it's nice to see a place where the sun shines a little more. Um, as I usually pick up a sort of portable mic and walk around because I, I have ADD, but um, I'll try to stay here because you've got a camera going and things like that. So I think the rules here are first, I would say to my students, first I have to entertain and then we maybe can educate. Um, and the two rules I have are don't drink too much coffee for a day like this and stay on time. And I already broke the first rule. So we're going to try to stay on time. I think I'm going to try to leave time for questions if you have questions. Um, my assignment today, I guess, is to uh, do a review of the Supreme Court's leading decisions or the term. We're in the middle of a term, you know, the Supreme Court's term runs from October 1st till technically the next October 1st. So we're in the middle of it right now. So I'm going to be talking about cases that are currently before the court and also some review of last term's cases. Uh, the way I like to do things, if, if you have a question about a case, and you want to ask it while we're talking about that case, just you know, throw your hand up or, or drop your coffee and, and I'll try to recognize you we'll talk. Um, it's a large group to have a dialogue, but I think uh, it's more fun to have a dialogue if we can. Um, so in the 2011 term, which was last year, the Supreme Court issued the lowest number of decisions that is, it has issued in many decades uh, nobody has really gone back that I know of and actually found when was the last time they issued as few opinions as 65 opinions, but that's what they did last year. This year they're on pace, unless they pick it up a little bit, to do even less. Um, and when you see the justices at various conferences, they're always asked, why are you guys not doing as many cases as you used to do? When I was clerking there, we did 160 cases, I think. So it's about a third, almost. Uh, and they all say, well, it's not me, it's those other guys, or, or, or women. Um, 
So we'll see. Maybe they'll do a little more uh, by the end here. Uh, it takes a certain number of months to brief a case. They've so far granted 55 cases. And if they're going to get those arguments in by April, which is when their arguments usually end, they're going to have to grant some very quickly in order to give the parties enough time to brief. Used to be you could be guaranteed an extension on your brief, and now they do it on an expedited basis. Uh, so the worst thing that can happen to you is have your petition granted. Um, there's, there's been one decision so far. <clears throat> I have it on my, uh, by the way, there is a little one-page outline buried in the uh, things on your, on your seat in those advertisements. Uh, it's double-sided. Um, I entitled it, Whose Legacy Is It Anyway? Uh, just because I was looking for a title. Uh, and the new dean at Hastings said, talk about legacy. So I said, sure, okay, you're the dean. Um, but, but the question comes up, uh, who, whose court is it now? Whose court is it now? And for years, you've heard people say, well, it's the Kennedy court. He may not be the chief justice, but he's always the fifth vote. Uh, and in fact, that's true. Justice Kennedy is most often in the majority of all the justices. Um, but last term, as you may recall uh, dimly, there was this case about the Health Care Act. Uh, and Chief Justice Roberts, in a sense, seized the reins of the court and said, it's my court, and I'll show you how. And of course, he became the deciding vote to uphold the mandate in these, uh, what we call the Sidelius case, uh, in a five to four decision. Uh, so Justice Roberts, and people have said about that decision that it's, it's reminiscent of Chief Justice Marshall the third Chief Justice, John Marshall, in Marbury versus Madison. You may rem remember Marbury versus Madison. Uh, Chief Justice Marshall was locked in a fight with his uh, third cousin, Thomas Jefferson, who, who he hated, um, and uh, had, a, had a ruling or, or an action before him uh, by this guy, James Madison, who had been the Secretary of State and failed to deliver a commission to somebody. And the claim was, you know, you got to order the president to deliver the commission. And, and Marshall sort of figured out that he didn't have any, um, you know, army to enforce an order. So he wrote this remarkable opinion where he basically ruled against the president right down the line. And then at the very end said, but actually the grant of jurisdiction to decide the case uh, is unconstitutional. So he invented judicial review. Um, and so we can't do anything about it. So he just excoriated sort of the president and then ruled in his favor uh, in, in a statesmanlike uh, way, we say today. Many people say that Justice Roberts' opinions in the healthcare decision was like that in the following sense. You may remember the issue was, can Congress, do, does Congress have the power to compel people to pay if they don't have insurance? That if they decided not to enter the health care insurance market, can you make them pay? The issue was, does the Commerce Clause of the, of the Constitution allow uh, Congress to do this? Uh, Justice Roberts wrote the opinion, his 5-4 his opinion, saying, no, Congress does not have that power. This is a violation of the Commerce Clause. And you may remember, uh, if you were watching that day when everyone knew the opinion was coming out, uh, Fox News had a headline saying, mandate struck down because you had to read to the third page of just the summary of the decision <laughs> to get to the next part where Justice Roberts said, but, you know, maybe we could uphold this as a tax, an argument which had been uh, sort of put off to the side uh, in, in most people's thinking. So he, he actually uh, issued this very strong ruling about the limitations of Congress under the Commerce Clause, which is a huge font of jurisdiction uh, for, the, for Congress to act. Many, many statutes are passed under the Commerce Clause, the, the Civil Rights Act, um, most of the New Deal legislation. He said, no, you can't do it, there's a limit to that, but we're going to uphold it as a tax. Having construed it as a tax, in some sense, uh, reduces the significance of, of that legal ruling, and meanwhile, the, he's got a very strong Commerce Clause ruling. And Justice Kennedy is apoplectic uh, because he's not the fifth vote on this one. He's, he's like, he took my court. Uh, that may not be the only reason he was apoplectic. Um, and many people believe, actually, that Justice Roberts switched his vote after the conference in that case. Many people believe that the initial vote was 5-4 to strike it down entirely, 
And the Chief Justice Roberts kept the opinion for himself, and when he issued a draft, surprise, it had this other part. Uh, so you see on my outline I say, um, who shocked everyone? Chief Justice Roberts is both a surprise and no surprise. Um, some other things that I'll tell you about the court sort of in, in general terms. Um, a third of the docket or more, almost half the docket last year, are criminal cases. So this is a court that is spending a lot of time uh, resolving criminal, constitutional criminal procedure cases. But this term, a lot of the grants, a lot of the certiorari grants are not criminal cases. They seem to be turning their attention pretty strongly towards uh, patent law, uh, environmental law, uh, copyright law, uh, what's in taking, sort of land use regulation. Uh, so this, this is a term I think where you're going to see far more cases decided civilly than criminally. Um, I asked some people on my faculty this question yesterday. Who asked, who, which justice asked the most questions at oral argument? And anybody that follows the Supreme Court could pretty much say, well, it's got to be Justice Scalia, because he's all over the place. Uh, on my outline, I give a credit to scotusblog.com, right? That's, that's where you want to go. I, everything I'm saying and, and, and have written here is stole from them. Uh, scotusblog.com keeps a tally of how many laughs they get at oral argument. <laughs> now, now, that's a kind of a sick, pathetic, uh, you know, who's the funniest justice? It's like being the tallest midget. Um, <laughs> Scalia takes this very seriously, so he asks questions that are laugh questions sometimes and not seriously. So, so who asks the most questions? Justice Scalia. Who's second on the list? That's one that I think surprises people. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor, a very new justice, uh, relatively speaking, asks the second most questions. Uh, and I think that's a big story in the court right now. You have a court today with three women. That's never been true in the history of the United States until uh, Elena Kagan was put on the court uh, two years ago. And Justice Sotomayor has developed this amazingly powerful voice on the court. And if you read transcripts or you listen, you can now, on Scott's, Scott's blog, you can now get links to uh, oral uh, audio tapes of the arguments. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor is right in there, pitching. She's, she, I think she has positioned herself very strongly as sort of Justice Scalia's foil, and she's usually not looking for laughs. She's, she's really just kind of zing in there. Uh, so keep your eyes on Sonia Sotomayor. Um, Justice Ginsburg actually asks questions, uh, and they're, they're deferential. When a senior justice starts talking and you start talking at the same time, you sort of shut down. But Justice Ginsburg's questions are much less uh, forceful, if you will, and many people think that she will retire in two years um, because she has said she wants to stay longer than her, uh, her hero, Louis Brandeis, the first Jewish justice on the Supreme Court. And if she serves two, two, this term and an, another term, I think that would put her uh, tied or, or just ahead of Brandeis, which would give the president another appointment, but probably not change the balance of the court. If someone from the other side were to retire, of course, and, and President Obama were to put somebody on the court, that could change the balance very significantly and we can talk about where that might make a difference. Uh, the last thing I've got on here is uh, who had the most vindication? I don't know if you remember after the oral argument of the health care cases, but a guy named Don Verrilli is the Solicitor General. And Don, uh, full disclosure, we were co-clerks for Judge Justice Brennan, so I like him. But he just got savaged by the critics. Uh, Jeff Tubin said it was one of the worst arguments he'd ever seen and he lost the case. And then, of course, in the end, uh, his position was uh, adopted by the court, at least on the tax side, uh, and he also won a case called U.S. versus Arizona, which struck down virtually all of the Arizona state legislature's efforts to regulate immigration uh, as a preemption matter preempted by the federal immigration uh, power. Um, and Don had argued that as well and been somewhat criticized. And so I'll just say to you that Don really uh, only has nine people as his audience. He doesn't care about, and, and the truth is, he really only has about three people as his audience. He doesn't care when Justice Scalia is insulting him. Uh, he doesn't really care if Justice Ginsburg is saying, oh, that's a great argument. He's only shooting at the middle, and if he wins with those three, 
it's a, it's a good year. So, uh, so I say, who ate the most crow? Jeff Tubin, because Jeff Tubin, after the opinion came out, apologized. Uh, not only went on, on TV and apologized, and apologized in print, he actually went to the Solicitor General's office and walked in and shook Donald Frehley's hand and said, I am sorry. <laughs> you, you don't see that very often in Washington. All right, All right let's talk about some decisions. Um, I feel like we've talked enough about the Health Care Act, although if you all want to ask anything about it, I'd be happy to. I'm kind of doing what I call with my students, this is a survey. We're surfing right now. We're, on, we're staying on top of the waves. We're not going real deep into some of these cases. So if you want to go deeper, let me know. But I feel like I'd like to cover breadth rather than depth. Um, and I am, in some sense, following this outline, although not entirely. Um, the Arizona versus United States case was big news because the court, again, five to four, invalidated state efforts to control immigration. This, this throws into some doubt laws in other states as well. And there's still one part of the Arizona law which survived, which, which people sort of caricature as the show me your papers law. The idea that a police officer has to uh, check immigration status when they detain somebody lawfully for some other reason uh, before they release them. The ACLU has already filed a lawsuit saying, as applied, they're using that in a racial profiling way. We'll see where that goes. The court was actually pretty uh, negative about that part of the law. They said, we're not striking that down because we don't know how it will be applied. But if it was applied in an uneven or uh, you know, racially profiling sort of way, we'd have real concerns. Or if it was simply used to detain people longer than they should otherwise be detained, we would have a problem with it. So keep your eyes open on that front. You may see another case uh, coming there. Um, the other big decision, the one that I think you all heard about, was the GPS case, you know, the Jones case, where the government had installed a GPS tracking device on the bottom of a car uh, and then tracked it for 28 days wherever it went and, and used that as evidence. Now, in that case, uh, we should point out, the government actually got a warrant to install this thing, but the warrant said you have to do it within 10 days and somebody couldn't count, and they, got, they did it on the 11th day. Um, and I've, I've actually talked to the government people about this, and they said, well, you know, it's hard to install a GPS thing. And I, I'm like, I don't know, I thought it was a magnet. <laughs> but, but, but they say, no, 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 we gotta go, we gotta have access to the car for two hours, and it's gotta be in a place where nobody sees us as we're rolling in and out under the car, and we're attaching it, and apparently there, some of them at least, they attach, uh, somehow to draw power from the battery of the car to keep it operating. Uh, others have a battery that they have to replace every 10 days. So if you're going to try for 28 days, you've got to get the car again. They also didn't do it in the District of Columbia, which is where the warrant said they had to do it. They, they went across the line into Maryland um, because they needed two hours, so they waited until the guy went to his health club. <laughs> they tried to do it at his girlfriend's house. He was married, but he also had a girlfriend. They tried to go to the girlfriend's house um, but he never stayed for two hours. <laughs> true, true story. <laughs> At least that's what I've been told. Um, right. uh, so in the Jones case, the issue is, can the government do this without a warrant, since the warrant they had was, was invalid, in a, in a sense, and uh, not effective, they didn't comply with it. So can you do it without a warrant? And one short answer to that would be, well, they thought they had to get a warrant in the first place, so, so why would that be a surprise that you have to get a warrant? But the government saw this as an opportunity to talk about technology and, and privacy. And their argument went like this. You guys may remember, some of you from law school, that in 1967 the Supreme Court changed the analysis of Fourth Amendment issues and said, we're going to talk now about expectations of privacy. When the government invades someone's expectation of privacy, that's a reasonable expectation, that's going to be a Fourth Amendment event. Even if they don't touch anything, that was a wiretapping case. It was a case that brought wiretapping into the, into the Fourth Amendment. So the government here says, well, there's no privacy expectation here because who expects privacy on the bottom of their car? Right? Nobody even knows what the bottom of their car looks like. Um, and it didn't interfere with any operation of the car. Whether th This was not one that sucked energy from the battery, apparently. Um, so there's no expectation of privacy. It's not a search, was the argument. Uh, five to four, the court rules that that's wrong. And what's actually nine, nine zero, they struck down this warrantless effort. 
but there was a division of justices that was more interesting than the result. So the government has to get a warrant to put a GPS on, at least if they're going to track it for 28 days. Um, Justice Scalia said, look, you, you trespassed. It's a physical trespass, and the framers understood trespass, and when you go on somebody's car and you bolt something on the bottom, it's a trespass, and we don't need to ask about privacy. Maybe privacy would have something to do with it if you didn't trespass, but here you did. And that's an important point because the government now is, has, or probably has, is working on technology that will allow them to somehow GPS track without touching the car, uh, satellites, uh, other technology. Right? The battle of sort of anticipating technology and under a document that was written in 1789 is, is not an easy one. Uh, Justice Alito uh, said, no, 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 you know, it's, this is a privacy case and there is no expectation of privacy, but I think it violated privacy when you tracked it for 28 days. And he said, it was interesting, he said, if you only tracked it for a couple of days, it might not interfere with privacy, but 28 days is too long. Um, the, the odd thing about that opinion is Justice Alito uh, wrote that opinion. He was joined by Ginsburg, Breyer, and I think, um, not Sotomayor, one of the other libs, <laughs> if, if there are libs. Um, so he was joined by people who disagree with him, I think, fundamentally on what the government should be able to do. Why did they join that opinion? They joined that opinion because he was saying you could violate the Fourth Amendment even without a trespass. Justice Scalia was saying you had to have a trespass, or at least maybe that's what he was saying. So my prediction is that that alliance, Alito and those other three judges, is going to break up. That's, they're not going to be together uh, the next time you see a Fourth Amendment case. And then Justice Sotomayor wrote the most interesting opinion. She wrote an opinion that said, I think we should re-examine the entire doctrine of what's called third-party sharing. So I don't know how many of you are up to speed on this, but the government can get your toll records of your phone, uh, your bank records, uh, your internet provider records under the following theory, without a warrant, uh, unless Congress requires it, because the theory is, you know when you dot a phone number or use the internet or send your checks out to the world, that somebody in the organization that runs that, your ISP or your bank or whoever, somebody can see that information. Having shared that information uh, voluntarily with a third party, you've waived any expectation of privacy. Uh, that's been the doctrine for, you know, 40 years. Um, Justice Sotomayor says we ought to re-examine that entire thing. Technology is too pervasive, and the Fourth Amendment, if it protects privacy, should protect privacy, even when we're sharing it in sort of an anonymous way with faceless bureaucrats. That doesn't mean we're sharing it with the government. Uh, I think that's a very powerful position to take, and, 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 and we'll see where that goes. Keep your eyes on that. There are two, at least two, maybe more, big Fourth Amendment, that, well, there's four, actually, Fourth Amendment cases in front of the Supreme Court this term, really quickly. Two of them involve dog sniffs. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a, a dog sniff. At the, the airports now, they use dogs to sniff for explosives and things. Um, there are, you have to train these dogs. You have to train them to alert to only one chemical. Uh, so different dogs detect different things. In Florida, this is a big uh, law enforcement technique, and they walk around with these dogs on leashes just in public. And, they, and so in one Florida case, they went up to the front door. So they left the sidewalk, walked up to the front door, you know, 30 feet. The dog sniffs around up there, finally settles down and alerts. Um, and, and it's a marijuana grow operation. Um, the Florida Supreme Court said you invaded the privacy of the home when you walked up to the front door with a dog on a leash. You weren't invited by the, by the homeowner. That's a Fourth Amendment violation. That case is pending in front of the Supreme Court right now. Is that right? Um, the other thing the Florida Supreme Court said is the government has to prove that the dogs are accurate. If they don't prove the dogs are trained and certified and accurate, we're not going to let it make out probable cause. Uh, that, those cases have both been argued, Florida versus Harris and Florida versus Jardines. And it looks like it's going to be a split. It looks like what the court is going to say is the dog, uh, the dog sniff is enough to make out probable cause if the, if the dog alerts, so long as there's some evidence the dog is trained to alert on a certain chemical. We're not going to require sort of specific accreditation. The Fourth Amendment doesn't have accreditation requirements. Um, but interestingly, Justice Scalia took a very antagonistic position 
uh, with the government's lawyer on can that you walk the dog up to the front door. And he said, wait, this is somebody's home. And home, house, is in the Fourth Amendment. It says people have a right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure in their houses, persons, places, uh, and effects. So Scalia says, that's a home. You can't do that. And the government says, well, we're just outside. Anybody can walk up to the front door. The, the neighbors can walk up to the front door. And they can bring a dog. And, and Justice Scalia says, I think that's outrageous that you inv invade the privacy of the homeowner. And then, to everyone's surprise, Justice Kennedy said, yeah, that's right. I totally agree with that. Well, if Kennedy and Scalia are against the government, you can, you can bet it's not going. <laughs> so, so, so interestingly enough, how is the, the outside the house, no trespass, dog sniff case going to influence technology, GPS, no trespass cases? Right? They've got to figure this out, and, and I don't envy their task. It's a, it's a tough area. The other two cases that are pending, and they just recently granted cert in these. These are on the back page of my outline. Um, one of them uh, is called Missouri versus McNeely. It actually uh, seeks to overrule an old 1960s case, which basically said you can't uh, force someone to give you a blood sample. You can't extract it by force, uh, even though you ex uh, suspect them of being a drunk driver. Uh, uh, because it's invasive, it's, it, you know, it invades a bodily sort of privacy idea. Um, and the government's argument is what the evidence is being destroyed, right? Every hour that passes, the blood alcohol is going down, is the theory. It's an exigent circumstance. We should be able to do this without getting a search warrant. Um, the, su the Supreme Court said in the 1960s, no, that's wrong, it, because at that time, drunk driving was a misdemeanor offense. They said, for misdemeanors, we're not going to allow the government to invade people like this. Uh, well, now drunk driving is a felony in many jurisdictions, or at least a very serious crime. And so that case is going to, I think, revisit that question. And then you have Maryland versus King, which is interesting. The Ninth Circuit has an opinion which is contrary to, I believe, the Maryland opinion. Uh, can you uh, enact a law which requires the government to take a DNA sample from everyone they arrest? Not everyone they convict, it's pretty clear you could take it from people when they're convicted, but when they're arrested, the, the, the question here is, when they're arrested, can you just do a little cotton swab in the side of their mouth? Um, not a very intrusive thing, it's not even like a blood test where you're sticking a needle in or something. Um, a lot of legislatures have done this because the cold hit DNA uh, data bank has been very valuable in a lot of jurisdictions, but the courts have been split as to whether you need some Fourth Amendment uh, reason to do this, either probable cause, reasonable suspicion, and you can sort of see maybe a warrant. Um, they're they're going to have to pursue, they're going to have to answer that question. That will be an interesting question because, of course, DNA, let's assume you're arrested and then it's an invalid arrest or something. DNA, if it stays in the data bank, um, can reveal a lot of things about you, it can reveal a lot of genetic things about you. The quite, and and there, most of these laws have very strict requirements on what the government can do with the information. But it's still out there, and so there's some fear that somebody will get the data that shouldn't have it. Um, and, and as long as I'm talking about that, the next case on my outline is a, is a tiny little case no one's heard of called Mariachich. M M I don't know how to say it. Spears. <laughs> we'll call this the other party's name. Um, which involves something called the Drivers, Drivers Privacy Protection Act. This is an act that says, you know, when you give personal information to get your driver's license, that information is protected. And it can't be given out to people. Um, this is a case where our favorite group of uh, individuals, lawyers, somehow got the information. And they used it to go advertise to clients. They were looking for clients based on some kind of data they got about from their driver's license. How they got it exactly, I'm not quite sure. Uh, that case is going to ask the question, can lawyers do this? Is there some kind of litigation privilege? Uh, you know, that allows lawyers, in a sense, to use information that may not have been gotten consistently with the Driver's Privacy Protection Act. Um, and my prediction is lawyers are going to lose on this one. Uh, you, we'll see. It hasn't even it hasn't even been argued. It's going to be argued in January. Um, let's go back to the front page and just tick off a few other cases from last term. Um, the, the case of Miller versus Alabama had a sort of a big impact in, in uh, California. It says that uh, juveniles, people under 18, cannot be given a life without parole sentence, we call it LWOP, cannot be given a life without parole automatically, mandatorily. 
Uh, as a discretionary basis, uh, you know, maybe the judge or jury has discretion here. Maybe that will be okay. Court didn't answer that question. But um, mandatory LWOP for juveniles is unconstitutional. I think there are 400 or 500 people in California who are serving LWOP sentences who were uh, convicted as juveniles. And so there's legislation, I believe, in California now that is providing some process for them to challenge that. Um, it's an interesting case. It didn't turn out this way, right? But you remember there was an issue, uh, a, a proposition uh, a week ago about getting rid of the death penalty uh, and imposing LWOP instead uh, and endorsing LWOP. It always struck me as a sort of a devil's bargain. Let's get rid of the death penalty and endorse a slow death penalty, which is what LWOP is. Um, and, and the analysis in Miller might have had some impact on that proposition, but it didn't pass. So, uh, U.S. versus Alvarez is a great little case about a guy who's running for water board in his local community, Alvarez. And Justice Kennedy begins his, uh, begins his opinion, first words of his opinion, lying was his habit. Um, <laughs> And this guy Alvarez lied about all kinds of things, and one of the things he lied about was I'm a decorated Medal of Honor winner, and he'd never, uh, I think he'd never been in the military. Um, and the question is, can you make it a crime to lie about the, having the Medal of Honor or military decorations in general? And, and it's a fascinating opinion, first of all, because it gives you the whole history of military decorations, which were actually initially uh, under our federal constitution. Uh, requested by George Washington when he was the general, and he, and he requested of the Congress at the time, which wasn't you know, under our Constitution, please create some military decorations so I can reward soldiers since you're not paying them anything. You know, and they're, they're out here starving. Could we have some decorations, please? And so there's this whole history, which is interesting. Um, and the question is, can you make it a crime if there's no benefit to the, there, the you're not lying to gain a benefit. And you're not lying to commit a fraud in any monetary sense. You're not lying to harm somebody. You're just lying. And there were some statements in old Supreme Court cases that said false statements have no First Amendment value. Uh, and so the court had to confront those. And somewhat surprisingly to some people, the court ruled uh, six to three this time that you cannot criminalize a lie that has no sort of benefit. There's a separate opinion by Justice Breyer that suggests that if there is a benefit, then you can criminalize it, and there's actually legislation introduced now to overrule or reverse this Alvarez thing, which would tie the lie to some benefit. Um, but here's what's funny, right? The Ninth Circuit actually, this was the Ninth Circuit case that went up. Judge Kaczynski's, you want to read a hilarious opinion, read Judge Kaczynski's opinion that led up to this. He goes on for about two or three pages about lies we all say all the time that shouldn't be criminalized, like, I love you. <laughs> The response to, how do I look? <laughs> or, you know, are you enjoying this talk? <laughs> it's hilarious. So I just, I just recommend it to you if you're looking for uh, some fun. If Kaczynski were on the court, Scalia would have real competition for the funniest justice, I think. Um, Florence case, uh, interesting case. It says it's okay to strip search anyone who is admitted to a general population in a jail, in a prison setting. Uh, the facts in Florence were pretty terrible. The guy was arrested on a warrant that was completely invalid. There was no reason to arrest him. There was some suggestion he was arrested and stopped because he was black driving a fancy Porsche or something. It turns out he worked at a dealership that sold Porsches. Um, and once they got him in there, and you heard my bio, I am from New Jersey. This was in New Jersey. They lost him. So they kept him in prison for seven days, even though there was actually no valid warrant to keep him at all. And they strip searched him three times, and so he sued about the strip search. Uh, and the court ruled, somewhat surprisingly, uh, given those facts, that you can strip search people because of the security concerns and the smuggling of contraband concerns, uh, even if you're arrested for a, an offense that you can't be jailed for. And that's always interesting. You know, they arrest you, they gotta do something with you, so they put you in the general population in the jail. But it's not an offense if you're convicted that you could even get jail time for. How do, how do they do that? I've always wondered. It seems like a magical trick. Um, last case I'll tell you about Missouri versus Fry and Lafla versus Cooper, mainly because they're funny, not because they're. But they are going to revolutionize plea negotiations. The court in Lafler and Fry extends the Sixth Amendment right 
to effective assistance of counsel, to plea negotiations. They had never done that before. So if your lawyer is horribly ineffective during a plea negotiation, but you pled, the idea was, well, you pled. You said you were guilty, so there's no remedy for this. The court in these two cases said, no, there is a Sixth Amendment violation if you're ineffective. Um, and you guys figure out the remedy, right? The Supreme Court loves to do that. Here's the big rule that you guys figured out. So you judges on the ground, if we have any trial judges here, you're probably already struggling with what the heck to do here. The facts are pretty uh, horrible and funny. In Fry, the guy was arrested on an offense that um, could have gotten a three-year penalty, I believe. He was sent a written plea offer to his lawyer that would have let him plead to a 10-day jail sentence or a 90-day sentence with some lesser conditions. His lawyer never delivered the letter to the client, never told him about it. Uh, it expired. Uh, so when he showed up in court and, and, and the guy said, do I get a plea offer? The prosecutor said, you already got it and it expired. You're done. The guy ended up getting three years. Um, it was a little unfortunate because in the interim between the plea offer and the sentencing of the three years, he actually got his, I think, sixth DUI uh, offense. So, so maybe there was justice done. Um, but it was totally ineffective, right? And so the court says, look, you know what? The defense counsel has one obligation at least, which is deliver plea offers. You have to tell your client. Uh, in Cooper, it's a little more... Uh, Coop, uh, Cooper was, I think it's Cooper as the lawyer, was charged with, or was the defendant, charged with basically chasing his ex-girlfriend with a gun, shooting at her head, missing, catching her a little later, and actually shooting uh, three more times, I think, and hitting her in sort of the hip, the leg, and the, the ankle. Pretty serious. He's charged with attempted murder. According to the defendant, the lawyer's advice was, don't take the plea offer, because since you shot her below the waist, you can't be convicted of attempted murder. <laughs> Which is absurd. Uh, so the court says, you know, that's ineffective too. There's some level of advice that is ineffective. Uh, we're not saying exactly where it is, but this is it. It's a fun remedy. All right. Um, we started a little, a little late, so I'm not sure. I, I do want to keep you all on time here. Next seminar starts at uh, 9:45. Uh, I have way more I can talk about, but do, do we want to have some questions? Does anybody? You want me to just keep going on my? Am I rolling? There's a question. <laughs> yeah, guys, speak really loud. Maybe you should stand up and. Uh, what, what do you think the long range impact of Robert's decision to slam the Commerce Clause as authority for Congress to act along the Commerce Clause? Well. Can you repeat it? Yes. What, what, what is going what, what do I think the effect is? This is crystal ball reading, right? What do I think the effect is going to be of the Commerce Clause ruling? Uh, which was against the government and against the power of Congress in the health care case. You know, it's a hard question to ask. Um, one effect is simply to eliminate the idea that there's no limit. Right? The idea was, if, you, if you're going to uphold this under the Commerce Clause, then there's no limit to what you can do. Um, that idea is taken off the table. There is a limit, and the limit is at least you can't make people pay money for not entering a market. Um, Will it actually, will the words of that opinion be used to try to attack existing uh, regimes like the Civil Rights Act? I, I would doubt it, although there's a serious argument that it could be done. Um, uh, I think more it will serve as a limitation for Congress, and, and, and here's the interesting side effect, right? Suddenly Congress has been told, guess what? If you make people pay for things, but you make it look like a tax, you can do it. And you're not even limited by interstate commerce. You can just tax them. So, I don't know, uh, the, one of the opinions says, well, but Congress won't use the tax power because it's so politically unpopular. I don't know, we'll see. So you may see more legislation by Congress that says, we're using the tax power, not the Commerce Clause power. You know, some people say, well, who cares? I'm, it's either a thousand bucks out of my pocket or it isn't. And I don't really care what the hook is. Um, so I think you're just going to have to wait and see, is the answer on that one. Uh, anybody else have a question? Uh, yeah. What is the early impression of uh, Justice Kagan? What's the early impression of Justice Kagan? Um, well, I actually gave a talk to the Marin County Bar Association about the court about six months ago. You'll be happy to know that they only had about a third of what you guys have here. Uh, they were all, you know, working with medical marijuana or something. Uh, that's a medium.
mean thing to say since I live it. Um, so what I said there was, Justice Kagan was previously the dean at Harvard Law School, and she, she looks like the dean. I mean, she just, she's, she's a sturdy, broad kind of woman, and she just kind of comes out, and she's very smiley, uh, but she's quite authoritative. So Justice Sotomayor actually is much less formal, if you will, on the bench. Justice Kagan is really, uh, has a gravitas, I don't know, is that a word that we could use? She's, she's, and she's, um, I, <laughs> here's my parody, right? She and Justice Sotomayor have gotten together in the back room and they've said the following, they've reached the following agreement. Uh, Sonia, you take the criminal cases, I'll take the civil cases. Uh, because she's writing these powerful dissents, she, her dissent, there was a campaign finance case in 2011 uh, called uh, Arizona Free Enterprise, uh, where the court actually um, invalidated some, uh, some uh, an Arizona statute which actually said, we can't limit the expenditures of the wealthy candidates, but we'll give more money to the candidates who don't have it if they spend a lot. That was invalidated. The theory is somehow that if you give other people more money, you're limiting the speech of the people that have it. Uh, I don't buy that theory, but Justice Kagan wrote a dissent, which is probably the most powerful thing she's written, uh, and it just just uh, tore into, uh, I think it was Justice Scalia's opinion. Um, so she's not afraid to, to get in there and mix it up. Um, she, she's a former government lawyer as well, Solicitor General. Some people are a little bit concerned that she's more uh, open to the federal government uh, as a government lawyer than than, uh, than Justice Sotomayor seems to be. Um, and, but, you know, she's certainly holding her own. I mean, it, 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 none, of the, none of the appointments to the court have been, uh, you know, bad appointments, right? There's nobody on the court that can't carry their own way. Justice Alito is one of the most powerful in the and he's carving his path independently as well. He doesn't always agree uh, with uh, Justice Roberts. Um, we will, I should mention, we will celebrate an anniversary on February 22nd of next year. It will then be seven years since Clarence Thomas has asked a question. <laughs> which, which I don't, I don't, I was talking to one of his clerks actually the other day. Um, I don't mean to, to say that to make fun of him. Justice Brennan, when I was clerking, didn't ask any questions either. Justice Brennan, every month we would prepare a list of questions for oral argument in the cases we were handling. And we'd give them to the justice and we'd talk about them, you know, before the argument. And every month they'd just sit there and he never said a word. Um, so it's not, you don't have to ask questions. And in some sense, Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer and some others have, have turned oral argument into just a question and answer session. There's no more, you don't prepare. Uh, I was talking to a, a guy named David Frederick who does oral arguments. He said he doesn't even prepare an argument anymore. He just prepares answers to questions. He doesn't deliver a 10 minute, because you're never going to get more than three words. Um, and Justice Thomas's view on this is, I don't need to ask any questions. I, I sort of already have read the briefs. I'm listening to my fellow justices, and they're wasting the time of the advocate. I want to hear from the advocate, not my fellow justices. So he's actually expressed this view to his fellow justices. Maybe you should ask less questions. So anyway, February 22nd, I'm sure you'll see this on SCOTUS blog. Though, so celebrate. Um, yes, question right here. Does the Miller v. Alabama decision apply to juveniles who were tried as adults? Yes, does Miller v. Alabama apply to juveniles to try to adults? And the answer is yes. In other words, if you're under 18, you cannot get a mandatory uh, LWOP sentence. It's an open question whether you can get a discretionary LWOP sentence. The, the, the opinion of the court, uh, Justice Kennedy writes it. He's really, Justice Kennedy has sort of reinvented the Eighth Amendment over the last 20 years. He's, you know, the mentally retarded, cannot get the death penalty. He's written some categorical decisions. And so he says here, we don't answer the question whether you get it as a matter of discretion, but we think it will be very rare, is what he says. Uh, there are 2,500 people around the country um, who have uh, LWAP sentences convicted as juveniles, and a lot of states are struggling, as is California, with exactly how to run that. Um, but yes, it would apply. Yes, sir? What do you think the Okay, so the Kirksen case is on the back page. Um, it's a Copyright Act case. I, 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 it sounds like you know a lot about it, so I sort of want to say to you what I say to students, well, what do you think? Um, but that's not fair. Um, 
So there's an old case from the 1980s called Kmart, actually, which involves gray marketed, trademarked goods. So here's what people do. Here's what corporations do. They get a trademark or they get a copyright, and they sell in the United States their goods for a certain price. They go overseas, exact same goods, and they sell them for a lower price. Right? So, you know, a long time ago, you go to Hong Kong and you could get stereo equipment at half the price. It's exactly the same goods, it's just price differential across markets. So some people have figured out they can make money doing this, so they go overseas, buy it at the low price in bulk, bring it back here, and then try to resell it and make money. In the Kmart case, the Supreme Court said that this, it, it, some people call it gray marketing, some people call it parallel importation. The Supreme Court said it's okay to do that, that you're not violating the trademark because when you sell it here, you're not changing the trademark, you're not misrepresenting it to be something else. Um, and there's a first sale sort of doctrine here, the first time you sell it, uh, then you've lost control. There's a similar kind of first sale uh, doctrine in copyright, but it's a different statute, and the Kmart case was based on this statutory history of the trademark laws. Um, there's a lot of um, money in this case, as you probably know, right? And the, and the amicus briefing is going to be huge. Um, so how's it going to come out? I really don't know because I haven't looked at the legislative history of the Copyright Act as carefully as possible, but there's a fair amount of concern that somehow this would uh, ruin the value of a copyright, that, that a copyright is an expensive, valuable part of a product, and if you could do this. And the, the response from the other side is, look, if you don't want people to do this, don't differentiate in your price. Sell it for the lower price in the United States and nobody can make money by bringing it in. So there's a little bit of a consumer protection side to this. I don't know how it's going to come out. Um, what, what do you think? Yeah, okay. So the consumer protection uh, theory is uh, being advocated on that side. Uh, you know, you can um, read the transcript of the oral arguments of the Supreme Court the day that they're made. You can get them on SCOTUS blog. You can get an audio tape. I think it's by Friday of the week that they're argued. So it's no longer this mysterious place that people like me can tell you about and you can't really learn it yourselves. You guys could do this firsthand, right? You're cutting me out of my, my, my bread and butter. Um, and I urge you to do it. I urge, so listen to the argument, read the transcript, and see what you think. Uh, Predicting based on oral argument is not so easy, right? The SCOTUS blog tries to predict based on oral argument. They have a success rate of a little bit over 60%, but not 70, 75, just depends how you count, actually. They're not 100% successful. Okay, one more question, I guess. I'm sort of doing this on my own, right? Anybody want to give me a high sign of stone timing? <laughs> let me, let me, oh, we got two more. One here and one back there. Do you have any predictions on how the court may approach the gay marriage issue? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I do. So far, they have been wrong. Um, uh, so, the Defense of Marriage Act, the federal statute, has now been struck down, and the Solicitor General won't even defend it any longer. Um, and there are something like five or six petitions now up there waiting, and I think it's now scheduled for the conference of November 30th. The conference meaning the meeting of the justices to decide what to take on November 30th. It's been scheduled on conferences before this, and everybody thought, oh, this is when they're going to do it. The, the, the smart money, uh, I don't know what that means, the people who watch seem to think that the court will grant cert in the DOMA case, uh, the Defense Manager Act case. The question is, will they also grant cert in the Prop 8 case from California? I have advocated that they should grant it both, mainly because one would be a federal law, one would be a state law. And I think that to the extent you think federalism has anything to do with this, it makes sense to have a pair up there. Uh, most of the people out there uh, blogging say, no, that's wrong, we're just going to let California go because it, Judge Reinhardt did his best to limit it to California in a sp specific way. I don't think he did that very successfully. So I think the court will grant both. That's my thinking. But, you know, on December 1st you can email me and tell me I was wrong. Because uh, I probably am. Last question. The DNA sample kits. Ah. Is that a distinction between Everyone was arrested versus those who were convicted? Yes. Or is it a distinction that getting your DNA is more intrusive than the photograph or fingerprints, which we always get from arrestees? Right. 
So, so the question is, the DNA, getting DNA from people arrested, is there a distinction between people who are arrested versus convicted? And the answer to that is yes. The court has, is focused on the question of arrested without being convicted. There seems to be the idea that there's no split among the lower courts on the convicted. Statutes that say if you're convicted, you have to give a DNA sample have been upheld uh, all over the country. Uh, and the other one was, is it more intrusive than fingerprints or photographs? That's one of the issues. There are lower courts who have said it is more intrusive because it reveals more information about you. It's not just identifying you, it tells you what uh, genetic fingers are, right? So we'll see how that goes. Okay, I, I feel like I should finish. Thank you very much.